Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, and good morning to our viewers here in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third event in our series, State to State, German-American State Legislator Dialogue. With this joint series, the ACG is pleased to continue our longstanding collaboration with the Aspen Institute Germany. Both of our organizations have recognized the increasing role of subnational actors, such as states, communities, and cities, in addressing issues that play a role in global affairs. And we believe it is critical to engage decision makers and opinion leaders at the state and local levels in discussions about these issues. The State to State series builds on initiatives that both organizations have undertaken in recent years. It provides a platform for the open exchange of ideas between German and American state legislators and a broad audience regarding the common challenges facing communities in both countries, including things like climate change, energy policy, migration, digitalization, and of course, the future of work. Even before the pandemic, workforce preparedness was a key issue facing communities on both sides of the Atlantic. And with the pandemic, the future of work, employment, and training have taken on even more importance. I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion and the insights from our speakers. Before we dive in, let me remind our viewers to please make sure that your mics are off so that there's no background noise. And we would be delighted if you would keep your video on so that we can make this a little bit more interactive and so that we know who's involved in today's discussion. So now I am absolutely delighted to turn things over to my friend and colleague, Stormy Miltner. She's the director of the Aspen Institute Germany and she will moderate today's discussion. And with that Stormy, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, um, Steve. As always, this is a real pleasure um, doing this event series uh, together with uh, ACG um, and to foster transatlantic relations and the state-to-state -state dialogue. Um, I couldn't think of any better partner to do so than with you, and it's always fun. So thank you so much and also for the introduction. And while you said I'm going to do the moderation or facilitate the, um, our dialogue, which, which I'm going to do, um, Steve, just also always jump in um, if you have a question to our panelists or um, to one, some of our audience even. And um, indeed, I would love to see many faces. Um, so please turn on your uh, cameras. One time um, I joked that if you don't do it, then we would do it for you. We can't, obviously, but it's nice. <laughs> but um, it's so much nicer to have a discussion with everybody on. We also want to do this as interactively as possible, meaning that we want to have a not just a Q&A, but we also want to learn from your experiences. So um, just let us know if you want to contribute um, via the chat function or raising your electronic hand. And we would call on you, or I would call on you um, to really have a discussion, not just writing something in the, in, into the chat function. So what we want to look at today is the state and the health of our economies um, and take a look at how our economies are changing. Um, our, on both sides of the Atlantic, our economies have been hit by two really big crises, shocks in a very short time. Um, many of you still, I'm sure, still remember the last economic and financial crisis of 2007 until 2011. Um, with big, big, I mean, it took us a long time to get out of, out of the recessions um, and to build back forward or build back better at that time. Um, and we can discuss if we had been successful uh, after the last crisis. And now um, our economies were hit with, a, with another big crisis, that time an ex exogenous shock, um, with huge, huge effects um, on our economies. We're still right in the middle of it and struggling to get out of it, even if the signs are pretty positive. And at the same time, our economies are undergoing a huge and deep structural change caused um, by digitalization, 
but not just by digitalization, but also by a, by a growing importance of the service sector in comparison to the manufacturing sector. So this is the situation we are facing. And we have to ask ourselves, are we sufficiently prepared for the future? Do we have the correct education systems? Do we create the right skills? Are we flexible enough to create the right skills? Um, are we able to learn um, and to induce and foster learning? Do we have the right laws and regulations, labor laws, um, but also laws with regard to um, privacy and data? Um, do we have the right framework and environment for innovation? Um, do we have the right investments by the state to foster economic growth? These are many, some of the questions which I want to ask um, our panelists a little later on. And I also would be delighted to hear from our audience. And I'm, I'm so glad that we have two really stellar experts um, on the topics of structural change, education, digitalization. And I'm very happy to welcome Christina, Christina Kampmann. Um, that always happens to me in an English context. I start to pronounce German names in an English way. Christina, <laughs> Christina, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, Christina is a member of the State Parliament um, of North Rhine, North Rhine-Westfalen, North Rhine-Westphalia, um, and she is with the um, uh, SPD. And I'm also very delighted from the other side of the Atlantic joining us today, Juan Fernandez Barkin. And um, he is a representative, um, a Republican with the um, Florida State Legislature. Um, and um, before we get right into the discussion, I want to ask our audience two questions. And it's really easy to answer these two questions because you only need your hand or you need a piece of paper. And if the answer to my question is yes, you put that little piece of paper in front of your camera so that your screen or your picture, your little slide goes blank. And the question I want to ask you is first, who has never been to Florida before? Cover your camera. Oh, ha. <laughs> Many of our um, audience have never been to Florida before. So who has never been to Nordrhein-Westfalen? Again, quite a few, not quite as many. And this is, <laughs> this is my first question to Christina. What makes your state special? And <laughs> why should everybody visit your state? Okay, um, first, that's not such an easy question, but I hope I can invite a lot of you to Northland Westphalia. What makes us special? I think, um, we are the state with the biggest population in Germany. I think we have about 18 million inhabitants in North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, we have great cities like Cologne. I'm sure that um, a lot of people um, know that. And um, I think if we talk about digitalization and um, the structural change, um, we have a lot of very progressive legislation, but I hope a lot of you can learn something from North Rhine Westphalia. Um, and we are a very beautiful <laughs> state. So you have to come to visit us and Maybe I will have the chance to visit Florida one time because I've never been there and I heard a lot of very, very um, great things about you. Um, so um, I, I want also to say thank you for the invitation and I'm really looking forward to our discussion about Northern Westphalia, Florida and um, all these issues about digitalization and the future of work. Thank you so much. So what's special about Florida? Um, I, 
there is so many things in Florida uh, that that I would encourage. I encourage all of you to to visit. And if you've been, please visit again. We have uh, Disney World, we have South Beach, uh, we have beautiful beaches, uh, and and just overall great entertainment, great nightlife. Uh, uh, it's a mix of cultures. We have a lot of uh, a, a lot of people from all over the world. Um, everyone is welcome here. Uh, we have we have a fair amount of Canadians who come down and vacation here. We have a uh, my family is Cuban. We have a lot of Cuban Americans here. I have also family that's Venezuelan. There's 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 a just it's a melting pot basically and just a fantastic mix of cultures. And I think you can find just about any food that you want here. Um, and, uh, and it's a great place to do business. Also, we are the gateway to the Americas when it comes, uh, to the United States. Uh, and, and we would ab actually, and absolutely love, uh, for all of you to visit. Thank you so much. Um, I think we will take you up, both of you up on your vacation, uh, on your invitation, um, on the next vacation, on the next business trip, which we are allowed to take, um, eventually, um, Right now, travel restrictions are pretty much still in place um, for a lot of places, but eventually I think we will be able to travel again. Um, let, me con let, let me start by asking you about structural change. Um, and what I first would like to learn is how structural change in, your, in, in our, both of our economies is manifesting itself so that we get a little bit of a better understanding what is really happening on the ground to see commonalities, but also differences. Um, and again, Christina, would you like to start? Um, yes, of course. So we have no beach in Northern Westphalia, but we have a lot of industry. And if you ask for structural change, I think we can see um, that the structural change in the industry is just taking place since since a lot of years. And when I visit, I, I just make a tour through North Rhine Westphalia and talk to many workers. Um, what is with your working place? What is changing um, in your everyday work? Um, a lot of them say that they fear this change, that they are a bit frightened um, if they look in the future and um, see the change concerning digitalization, concerning climate change, um, and also concerning globalization. And um, I have the feeling that some that this is for some of them the reason also to vote populist parties. Um, that is just a very um, big problem in Germany and I think that could be a result of this change and so I think we are now in the responsibility to give them more solutions that we can that we can um, have a solution for this change for all workers in North Westphalia because I don't want that anyone is frightened I want that they know that politics um, try to find solutions for them and to help them um, that we make this change um, to a success and that we have social progress in the end, social sustainable progress. That's our aim and we try to work on that. So I understand that um, structural change is taking place and it also manifests itself sometimes in job losses and that some, from your experience, people are also sometimes afraid of what is happening, um, to be left behind. And that can result in um, not just fear, but also populism. And did I understand you correctly, Christina? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, do you see something similar in, in Florida? Well, so there's there's all these different kinds of changes, right? We we have environmental change with climate change, which which in Florida we're ground zero. I mean, we are literally at sea level, and every there's always a, about three weeks out of the year where there are certain parts of Miami of the city of Miami, which is right on on the water actually you see the water creep up they call it king tide and you see about two three feet of of water uh coming onto the street and it'll stay there for two or three weeks so 
there's, you know, we're, we're dealing with climate change. So that's one kind of change. And that's something that, that, and I've told people in my own party, it doesn't matter who created this, but it's something that we have to deal with. And it's here and now, and one way or the other, we have to deal with this now. Um, we have technological change, which is putting people out of work. You have older segments of society who were used to, for instance, manufacturing jobs that now are becoming, uh, that machines can now do. You have also service industry that is now also getting digitized. And I understand what Christina is saying is that when individuals are in a vulnerable mental state and when they have lost their jobs and when they're depressed, their, their scapegoat is to, is to join, an easy scapegoat is to join a populist movement where they can blame other segments of society. But in reality, they don't confront the reality, which is the digitization and the technological change that is undergoing in society. And they, it's easier to blame people than it is to actually um, make yourself vulnerable and improve upon yourself. And whether it is going back and educating yourself to learn new skills in order to rejoin the workforce. Um, I mean, but, but I would say that, yes, I, I haven't seen it because luckily the last six months, state of Florida has done economically very well compared to many of the other states in the United States, um, Florida and Texas, we we were able to open up much faster than all the other states by pushing the vaccine, by pushing safety standards. So we were able to, we still have a high unemployment, but relative to other states, it's not. So I would say in general that you, yeah, you can find a populist movement, but it's not, it's not very popular. Um, it's not it's not mainstream at all, um, but but mostly mo most of what I encounter here is just this fear, the fear over the virus, fe this this mental depression, if you will, of people who are just scared to go outside their house, scared to interact, and 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 I think that in the long term we don't know the mental um, the mental consequences and the, the mental health consequences that the virus has has wreaked on on young people by not going to school on older people by not being able to interact with their families and and i just think that it's not just the economic damage this virus has done but i think it's also the mental health issues that this virus has caused uh we have even we have not even scratched the surface of of what this this has done if i may pick up on this um immediately um what we are currently seeing, I guess, are the short-term effects of the corona crisis. Um, and you rightly pointed at uh, possible long-term effects, um, especially um, looking at kids who weren't able to go to school, but also um, the um, pretty much the whole workforce who had to work from home with all the um, challenges from home, but also older people who had um, who are at home alone um, and um, with all the mental health, health um, issues surrounding that kind of picture. I would like to ask, I would like to pick up on this and ask both of you, is this something which you are already discussing um, in your state legislatures and are you devising policies to address these long-term effects? And maybe Juan, if you could um, uh, start this time and then we hand over to Christina. Sure, thank you. Um, well, since we were op since the state was able to open up, oh, oh, well, let me give this background first. Um, so the state of Florida is is if you take a look at the state of Florida and treat it as a country, our economy is the seventeenth largest in in the in the world, um, and our population is twenty two million. Our our budget is roughly our state budget this last year was I think one hundred and one billion dollars. So. Most of that, about 40% of that, goes to um, uh, healthcare, specifically Medicaid. So what we were able to do this last year, and we had so much money, um, I think it was a combination of the federal government giving us money and also just an increase in business because since we were open, a lot of people from other states were coming down here to live, to rent, 
And, and when they do that, a lot of our budget, about a third of our budget comes from a sales tax, from a 7.5% sales tax across the state for any goods and, for any goods and most services. Um, so we were able to basically have a much larger budget than we anticipated. We thought that we were going to have to cut a lot of social programs, and we were actually able to put more money into social programs. Um, and that's basically how we were, how we're dealing with the anticipated health issues, mental health issues, is by putting more money into social programs, putting more money into health, and also taking a closer look at these programs to make sure that they're efficiently, that the money is efficiently used and putting in checks and balances to make sure that that it's used efficiently. I, the, the last leader of the House of Representatives used to say, and he was a very conservative individual, but very fiscally conservative. And he used to say, and this has stuck in my mind, that it doesn't matter how much money you throw at a program. It, it doesn't matter if, if the program is still inefficient. You have to make sure that the program is, in, is efficient and that they're using the money properly. So that's what we've been able to do also this last year was make sure to, as we say in American politics, trim the fat to make sure that it's lean. Um, so, so that's basically how we've been dealing with, with, uh, with, with those anticipated, excuse me, anticipated issues. Christina, and both of you just feel also free to jump in, right? You don't always have to wait for me to say, and now Christina is saying, and now Fran is saying, um, we want to have that, that as a flu, fluent uh, discussion. And before Christina, before you start, I also wanted to draw um, the attention of our audience to the chat function, because Rob posted the CVs of both of our speakers um, because of the, in the sake of time, I did not go more deeply into it, but it's in the chat function, if you haven't seen that. So, Christina. Um, yes, thank you so much. So, to be honest, um, we don't really discuss the long-term effects. We discuss a lot about the consequences for economy, um, but we don't have a debate on the consequences um, of all other is issues, I would say. Um, if we talk about culture, if we talk about mental health, the consequences for children and especially for young people, um, for students who don't have the chance to go to university in this time. So I am sure that this will be a very huge problem when the crisis is over and I hope it will be, <laughs> it will be over in some months. And I'm, I'm sure that we then will see the, the long-term effects and the problems. But I think the reason why we don't discuss that enough, I would say, um, were that we have to react so fast all the time. And um, we always have to, um, yeah, have to do new measures because the crisis and the pandemic is changing all the way. There were um, always new challenges we have to face. Um, but I think we, we had the possibility um, to discuss this long-term effects, but uh, because otherwise um, we will have very huge problems concerning children, concerning young people. Um, and I think now it's time to, to have this debate um, because otherwise it would be too late. That's really interesting. Um, I mean, sometimes it's very typical of, of crisis management, right? I mean, you focus on the immediate crisis. Um, and then it's hard sometimes to find the tipping or the, the, the point where you start to think or you need to think about the long-term um, effects. I would like to pick up on one of the um, issues both of you mentioned, um, and that is technological change and digitalization. And um, it is changing how we are working. I mean, how we are living practically, but also our, um, how we are working, how we are producing. Um, and I wanted to ask both of you, um, because it requires new skill sets, um, of our, for, really for all of us, right? But especially also in production. Um, are we ready? Do our young, young people, do they have these skill sets? And if not, um, what do we need to do to get the skill sets right? So I can try <laughs> to, to start, um, that's, that's not an easy question. I think in Germany and also in Northern Westphalia, 
we are not ready because you are right. We have a growing demand for, for sp especially technical skills. Um, I think creativity and communication skills um, are becoming also more important in the future. And in order to be able to tackle these issues, we have to start at the beginning in our schools. In school, every child has to learn programming. That's um, my opinion and using new media responsibly. We need innovative learning concepts, considering um, more the benefits of digitalization. And that's that all things um, we have to do. And we see during the pandemic that we were not ready um, for e-learning and um, for, for learning from home. And now we have to do um, all these measures because otherwise our children and our young people won't be ready and um, digitalization is not something that will happen in the future. It's just happening now. So we have to be faster concerning these issues. If I may ask a follow-up question, um, we, we can be proud of our dual education system. Um, it's one of the, where we would also say the export schlager, an export hit. <laughs> and um, a lot of times uh, other countries are, are looking towards us, um, looking for inspiration with regard to the dual education system. Nonetheless, over the last decade, more and more kids in Germany did not want to get a technical education, but wanted to go to university and more and more kids are doing so. Is this, is, is this the right way, Christina? Um, no, I think it's not the right way. My party um, always says everyone um, has to have the chance to study. Um, but now I think um, it's changing and we say it's also great um, to take part in our great dual system because we see that we have um, so many students and nowadays everyone has the chance um, to study, but we need more people um, with more technical skills, more people who take part in this system. And um, so I think um, the meaning of politics um, or or the, the debate in politics is changing and we try to make this more attractive for young people. So Juan, how is it in Florida? Well, we've been, so we've, we've been changing and offering more opportunities and increasing scholarship opportunities for children from low income families. Um, we have several programs for it, but they also have access if they want and any student has access to specific special programs to what's called magnet schools that concentrate on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And this is something that every year we, we, we expand the program and we've been expanding it slowly. But it's something that um, I, I would say that we, we drastically need to keep increasing and putting more and more and more uh, investment into it and offering opportunities for young people in these fields. Because I think it's not just the state of Florida, but I think the United States in general has this very serious issue that we import the a lot of individuals who, who handle and who participate in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields. And I think in general, the state of Florida and the United States needs to make a larger investment in that because we, we cannot keep, keep um, in, um, importing that. And it's funny that, that you, meant, you mentioned the exporting, but, but this is the other side of it, is, is it, it puts us in a very vulnerable position. Um, so, so what we've been doing in the state is just offering more and more programs to younger children um, to try and get them more interested in this. After school programs also, there's a very, there's a fantastic after school program um, at, a, at a junior high that I was able to get the funding for, and it's not too far away from my house, that allows children about three hours every day after school to play with robotics and how to, and how to program robotics. And, and they showed it to me. It's, a, it's fantastic. It's the most amazing thing ever. It's like these little machines, and they teach the kids how to, how to program the robots to walk 
you know, and to do certain things. But that's how you start is that you have to start at a very early age. And also on the on the other end, when they get to university, you have to give them the an incentive. Um, I'm, I'm a very firm believer in very limited government. But the but I do believe that the government needs to give incentives in the form of more scholarships for for young people to study these fields, and that's a way to do it is to just offer more scholarships in these fields to incentivize um, students in the university to study this. Thank you so much. Um, before I open it up um, for the discussion with the, our audience, I would like to jump back to the issue of structural change and how to man manage structural change. And I would like to um, both of you to have a look into the past. Um, but um, I know that, that Steve, um, that you have already done so as well, and you are very interested in the topic. So I want to get you into the conversation as well now. Thank you, Stormy. Um, I, I actually wanted to ask a question about, about structural change, um, which obviously is an issue that both Florida and, and particularly North Rhine-Westphalia um, have been dealing with and are dealing with. And, Christina, I, I found your comments very interesting about um, the narrative uh, of North Rhine-Westphalia and wanted to know whether there are any lessons that have been learned in the state from the past periods of Strukturwandel that could be applicable today as we begin to emerge from the simultaneous public health, economic and social justice crisis and think about the future. Um, you know, are, are there lessons that you can draw upon from the state experience that might be applicable in the state, but also more broadly? Yes, I think there are lessons. And I think the main lessons um, are education and lifelong learning because both were in the past and I think also in the future, um, issues for Northern Westphalia and for Germany as a whole, because the way we work now is changing so radically, especially due to the digitalization we just mentioned um, a lot. And the challenge is to equip the workforce for the working world of the future and also for all new forms of work. We have to develop and we have to adapt workers' qualifications and skills today changing in a world of work and we have to make them able to upscale and to change their careers to be prepared for all forms of work we will have in the future. I think the importance, um, for example, of HR management has grown over the past decade in a competitive environment. Intelligent firms have realized that a long time ago and incorporated these ideas in their strategies. And I think that must be the way for the firms, but also for, for politics to support them to um, face these challenges in a very, very um, successful way in the end. Would you also like to come in, Juan? Yes. Well, I, I would say I, I absolutely agree with with a lot of what Christina said and, and essentially all of it that education, but to begin with education and opportunity is by far the most important thing when when I mean, if you want to discuss social justice, and I've, I've discussed this at length with a lot of the the African Americans in the Democratic caucus um, who are in the state house. And we all agree that education and opportunity to education is a key um, for any segment of society that, that is in a lower, lower socioeconomic class, um, that it is the easiest and the most sound way financially and economically for them to pick themselves up and, and, and get the situation. Um, the, the, I, I think, yeah. It's just education on an opportunity and the government has to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity to be able to get that education. And that's what we've been able to accomplish by expanding the scholarships for lower economic, for, for families in a lower economic setting 
um, by giving them scholarships, by giving them, um, it, it's essentially like a, it's kind of similar to, I think Sweden does it, that they give a, a voucher uh, to the parents and, and, and they say, hey parents, you send your child wherever you want to send them. So, so that's what we've essentially done and we've grown that program massively and we, we intend to keep growing it. But education and opportunity, that's number one, always. It is very, very interesting. When I was still with the Federation of German Industries, BDI, um, I had the pleasure of uh, traveling to the US quite a bit and also traveling to Chicago and traveling to Atlanta, um, two hubs um, of a lot of German companies and also the hub of two German um, dual education program implementation efforts, so to say. <laughs> And um, BDI had a represent, or still has a representation in Washington, which is called RGIT. And um, we have the pleasure that we have one of our, my former colleagues with us, um, Viola Meyerweisflug. And um, there she is. Um, and I wanted to bring her into the conversation by telling us a little bit about the experience on the ground with these dual education um, efforts. Right. Uh, hi, Stormy. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, first of all, um, for uh, yeah, inviting me today um, uh, on, a, on a spontaneous note. I'm happy to give yeah, just a little bit of an overview of um, how the German-American Chambers of Commerce here in the United States are kind of tackling those issues that we've been discussing. Um, you know, and uh, as Stormy uh, correctly said, you know, they've uh, specifically in Chicago and in Atlanta, um, they have implemented you know, two programs and are also certifying third party apprenticeship programs um, to somewhat German standards. Um, and, um, but before I dive into that, I just wanted to say, you know, we've also, we are experiencing this skills gap, you know, that we've been talking about. Uh, and yes, the service sector is changing, uh, but the manufacturing sector is changing massively. You know, we have, um, uh, I think, uh, you know, there are studies that project that three to uh, you know, three and a half million US manufacturing workers um, are required in the next decade. And um, the skills gap will actually result, you know, will result in over two million of those jobs going unfilled if we don't, you know, kind of focus more on, on the technical skills development. And so the German American chambers have started um, uh, a couple of years ago to like build up um, programs. Uh, one of them is called the Industry Consortium for Advanced Technical Training or ICAT uh, with double T at the end. Um, and, and it's just an example of like how, how to approach it kind of on the ground. We, we, you know, both, both chambers, Atlanta and, um, and Chicago and also actually New York and Pittsburgh um, are serving over, you know, 100 companies and are employing, so to speak, over 120 apprenticeship, apprenticeship um, programs and apprentices currently. Um, and it's just, it's just important to, you know, to realize how, um, how those apprentices are, um, you know, you know, they're saving money, um, by, 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 they're actually earning money. It's kind of this earn, um, uh, you know, earn as you, you, uh, learn approach that they're, uh, going after. Um, and it's, it's jobs that, um, are, you know, very valuable for the future. Um, you know, they're jobs reaching from advanced manufacturing technician to computer controlled machining um, to pharmaceutical manufacturing technician. So it's, these are very specific um, industries um, that, that are being served by these programs. Um, and, and I think, you know, we've talked a lot about how, you know, politics or, or states can kind of further this. And, you know, we talked about scholarships and, and handing out um, incentives, so to speak. And I think one of the biggest incentives, I guess, for students over here in America is, you know, to essentially not go into debt and, and, and earn while you, while you're, uh, while you're earning, while you're earning as, you know, you earn an associate degree and you earn money at the same time, and you are essentially guaranteed a job um, afterwards. And for the company side, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a good investment as well. You know, it's, it's a sustainable solution that builds kind of a loyal workforce that, um, has, you know, high retention rates um, and just kind of ensures that standard of excellence um, that I met. And one of the important things that I just want to, you know, um, throw in here, so the German-American chambers are not just, you know, helping German companies that are experiencing that skills gap, you know, they are ex expanding more and more to American companies. And it's really a very 
you know, it's this export schlager, this 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 export, um, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's one of the biggest exports of Germany. But having said this, it's 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 been, you know, um, it's not been like it's, it's it's a blueprint. But you can't kind of take the program as it is in Germany and take it over here because uh, it 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 is such a very very country, and we have such you know different pockets of environments. So it is important to kind of find regional approaches here, and you know the apprenticeship system. I always say in America, like there's no one apprenticeship system. It's there, there's very many different pockets, um, but it's just an example, kind of on on the ground of how you can um, tackle these, uh, you know, these challenges that we're facing. Yeah, and and Viola, if I can add that that, I mean, when you when you looked at old, the old manufacturing sector in the United States, and and you take a look at 1950s, right? Uh, someone could start a job in their right out of high school, 18 years old, work at the same job until they're 65. Um, we joke around, you know, get a gold, get the gold Rolex, right? Get a pension. Those days are gone. Right. They're never coming back. And that's just the reality of it. Right. So, I mean, what you hit on is so important. One, the no debt. Two, earn, earn while you learn. Right. And I'm still considered, and, and I still consider though, and, and, and I'm determined, I'm sure that a lot of the students nowadays, they, they crave those, that time when they could just go to a company and stay there for 40, 45 years. Yeah. But an apprenticeship program gives them the opportunity and at least the hope to be able to do that. Absolutely. Especially, yeah, especially in a society right, right now where, where things are so fluid and constantly up in the air and people are have gig jobs besides their full-time jobs and all right. that. So, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'm very happy to hear that. We already also now have the first questions um, and please just raise your electronic hand. And as I mentioned earlier, we would also love to hear from you um, and from also our younger participants, because we have been talking a lot about what the younger people want and how they are perceiving the situation. So it would also be great to hear from you. But the first question um, is by, um, El by Ellen, Ellen Post. Um, and I would like to call on you um, to ask your question. And the screen is yours. Good morning and guten tag. Uh... I am not one of the younger people. I'm a retired electrical engineer uh, in Andover, Massachusetts, which is open for business if you have um, if you have your uh, vaccinations. Um, my question concerns healthcare, and because um, Stormy has allowed me to do this verbally, I might expand on it a little bit, and just I concerned about the differences between the healthcare systems in Germany, and perhaps if it's different in Rhineland, North Falia, um, West Falia, I'd be curious, and in Florida and actually in the US, perhaps the differences might be better addressed um, on a national basis. But the question I have is what is the state of Florida and other states, how do other states compare with German system? And um, I would hand back to Juan and then Christina. Well, um, thank you, Alan, and that's a fantastic question. So I, from my understanding, in Germany, there is universal health care, and, and clearly in the United States, that, that's, not, that's not the situation. Um, but in the state of Florida, what we've done is uh, we decided to not expand. We expanded Medicaid very, very, very minutely in regards to uh, pregnant women um, and, and postpartum. Uh, but overall, it is something that constantly being analyzed every year. Um, what we've concentrated on the last three years is actually reducing the cost of health care to make it more affordable for the common person. One of the big things that a lot of people don't know, at least in the, that in the state of Florida, hospitals and a lot of uh, emergency healthcare centers and standalone ambulatory centers 
um, they need a certificate from the state and they basically get like a monopoly and there's a bunch of bureaucracy when it comes to that. And a year ago, we were actually able to do away with that and basically allow if you want to do a standalone ambulatory center, or if you want to do a hospital, there's no regulations on where you can do it. You can just do it. I mean, it just comes down to a zoning issue where you have to get local approval for it. But from the Department of Health side, there's a much less bureaucracy on that. We've also expanded the scope of practice uh, for nurses, for physicians assistants, um, and, for, and for pharmacists in certain regards, all trying to lower the cost of healthcare um, to make it more affordable for the common person. Um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in, and I've been doing a lot of research, is not just expanding the scope of practice for certain medical professionals, but in actually allowing, uh, building upon the health, uh, the health savings account and trying to do like a, and this is very premature that I even talk about this because I've only started my research on it, but for the individuals in the who, who are on the lower socioeconomic side of the spectrum to give them health savings accounts so that they can basically um, choose which medical professional they want to go to for services. Um, this is something that I know there's a couple of, uh, specifically uh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw, this is a big thing of his, and I've, I've looked into a lot of the stuff he's been advocating for. And I would love for Florida to do something in that end because I think it comes down to efficiency. And when you have the government just reimbursing for medical services, there's no competition. But when you can empower the individual to choose which medical professional they wanna go to, then, then now you're talking about competition that can potentially drive the cost of healthcare down. So thank you, and also from me, I want to give you a very short answer because I think there's not so much time left. But in Germany, um, you mentioned that everyone has access to health to the healthcare system, and I think what that was um, really an advantage during the pandemic, um, especially in the pandemic, but. Um, also, if you think of all other situations, because everyone has to go to a doctor and um, to a hospital very early and no one has to pay. And for me, that's absolutely the best system because I think health is so important for every human being. And it can't be the way that it depends if you have more money or less money, if you are rich or not, if you are a migrant um, or everyone else. So I think um, that's the best healthcare system we can have. We have to improve um, also some issues in Germany, um, but I think it has to be free for everyone. Um, and that is the best solution I can think about. Thanks for this very strong call for universal health coverage. <laughs> Um, now I hand over to Rob, um, who has also a question to both of our speakers. Hi, everybody. Um, so over the last year and a half, I've been involved in a project with the American Council on Germany that is focused on, we've called it the Transatlantic Cities of Tomorrow, um, Digitalization and the Future of Work, where we've been bringing together local practitioners um, to sort of compare the issues around digitalization and how it's affecting their communities, both at the local level and also at, at the state levels. And one of the things that we observed both in the United States and, and, and in Germany were communities and also states trying to create more sort of agencies, if you will, that are spo focused specifically on digitalization and how to incorporate that into structural change issues, workforce preparedness issues, et cetera. And I, I guess I'm curious if, if Christina and Juan, you could say a little bit about what your states may or may not be doing in that regard in terms of really putting a focus on this at the political level, at the state level, so that the priority is really given to addressing these issues, um, both from a policy standpoint, but also from, from a, a funding standpoint. Thank you so much. I would like to add two more questions um, for then a last round, um, because time is running short already. And I would like to call on Benedict Brüning. Yes, thank you very much. 
Um, my question is, um, since I'm one of the youngest here, uh, younger here, um, for me, um, internet, globalization and internationalization is very important. Therefore, I do my um, vocational education here and want to go over to US. But since um, the education is so different sometimes, in the US, they don't know what I have been taught about. And the same goes around when the people from US is coming to Germany and have their kind of qualifications. Companies say, and what can you do now? It's kind of a no, no general um, education or no standard where uh, international, uh, on international level and community uh, kind of a standard need. What we achieve kind of is kind of the, the university degree, bachelor, everyone knows, okay, you have a bachelor degree, but on the, the technical level, there is still um, a lot to do, I guess. Thank you so much for bringing in that perspective as well. Um, and then I would actually, I do have to add two more questions. Um, the, the, the first one is on diversity. Our economies um, and also our companies are more resilient and future oriented if there's diversity. Um, are we doing what, 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 what can the state, the government do to foster um, diversity uh, and what could we learn from each other? And another question, and um, I love that question, and it's a great um, question also to then end our discussion with is, so where do we take this whole, the whole discussion from here? Um, can we turn this into a transatlantic agenda um, on the future of work, on the future of economy? So these are a lot of questions for the last round. Um, Christina, would you like to start? And then Juan. Okay, I will try that. First of all, um, Rob, we discussed that very intensively in North Rhine Westphalia in the parliament and also in the government for us, um, the key question is how do we turn technological progress into sustainable social progress um, in all levels? And um, I think we have to find um, the right legislation and the right measures to reach this aim, because if we want to take advantage of the opportunities offered by the digital transformation we talked about, we have to invest, and I uh, mentioned that before, more in education um, and in training, and continuing education and training has to become more a normal part of life. I think in Germany, that's um, only in the beginning, um, but it's not something that you do um, your whole life, and I think that has to be the aim. Um, then, Benedict, thank you also for your question. I, think you, or if I understand you right, you um, want to see education more comparable, like we did that um, in the European Union with the bachelor um, and the master. I think that's a good point, and that could also be a task for a transatlantic agenda to discuss um, that more, and I think um, we should do that. Then we have the question concerning diversity, what can governments, what can parliaments do? Um, my wish is that we have more diversity in our parliament, <laughs> first of all, because I don't know how the situation in the US is, but um, we have two less women, for example, um, and two less migrants. And I think we have to work on our, our own, first of all, um, to, to live more diversity um, in our parliaments and um, in, in politics, because we, we have um, our Chancellor Angela Merkel, but we have um, not so much women in the Bundestag and also in Northern Westphalia. And um, that's one of my aims, um, because I want to, to improve this, this situation concerning diversity. And the last question, question was concerning a transatlantic agenda on the future of work and um, how can we reach this? I, I think um, this discussion could be one of the first steps to build this transatlantic agenda. I think we um, have to cooperate more at this point and we have to discuss also more special issues. I learned a lot, um, especially concerning 
um, incentives for for some um, issues we discussed. And I want to thank you so much, um, Juan and Stormy and all um, the other the other speakers of the audience um, for your for your points of view, because I think in Germany and in Northern Westphalia, we can learn a lot. And I always try to do that. So thank you very much for the discussion today, because um, I think we have not so much time now. Um, and so it's something like the last speech today. <laughs> no, thank you so much. And with this, I hand over to Juan. Yeah, and thank you so much for the invitation. I um, I, I would say the uh, what's most critical is definitely opportunity for all segments of society to be able to get a good education. That's that is that is critical in all societies, um, and it's th certainly the government's job to make sure that those opportunities are available. Um, and and Benedict, to your point in regards to the education, um, yeah, I I totally sort of uh, uniformity to be able to judge individual standards and individual skills in order to determine whether or not they're qualified is critical, whether it be through some sort of a licensing program that's recognized by multiple countries, or perhaps uh, a group of universities who can certify that these individuals have the skills, that would also be ideal. But some sort of uniformity to ensure that these individuals have the, have the requisite skills when it comes to these jobs, um, and and as far as diversity, I I mean I'd be very I'm very proud to say that uh, off the top of my head, the state of Florida's um, House of Representatives is pretty well represented um, in in by minorities. Uh, there's a lot of minorities um, in the Florida House of Representatives, at least individuals Hispanic individuals um, is about is is at least I think eight to nine percent, which I think is a fair, a fair pop probable population uh, assessment in, in, in the state. As far as African Americans, I want to say at least 30, at least 25, certainly at least 25. So I mean, the minorities are definitely well represented in the Florida House. Um, I mean, and, and they have a we have we we don't have a Hispanic caucus yet. That's something that I've been working on um, because there's several other states that do. But the purpose of that would be to establish scholarships for for children of Hispanic descent to be able to um, just just a scholarship for university or or for private school for private um, high school if they want. Um, but I know that the there is a black caucus and they they fundraise well for scholarships. In order to provide opportunities for 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 uh, young people in their in in their neighborhoods, um, but just want to harp back again: opportunity and education and training is critical in this in this day and age. Thank you so very very much to both of you. Now I'm going to pose one last really difficult question to Steve. <laughs> what have you learned from the discussion today? <laughs> Oh, Stormy, Stormy, thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. You know, it's it's been really fascinating to, to listen to this conversation um, because I feel like Christina and Juan um, covered a lot of issues. You know, if I think back to the beginning of the conversation, we started looking at structural change, the history and tradition of adaptation in Florida and North Rhine-Westphalia. But we also talked a little bit about how we can emerge from the, the current public health and economic crises. And I think one of the threads that was woven through this and, and through other discussions that we've hosted at the ACG is that with increasing digitalization, we need to focus even more on digital literacy and that that's something that seems to be falling by the wayside, that the importance of education and training and workforce preparedness cannot be understated and is something that we really need to keep front and center when we think about the future but also this piece about creating opportunity for all. And I think that Juan touched very, you know, specifically on the role of education in that. But I'm also thinking, what about opportunity after education and trying to keep doors open and pathways open for people um, so that they have opportunities as they move forward? Undoubtedly, we could have dug, you know, even deeper 
into all of these issues. But maybe the biggest takeaway for us, Stormy, and the homework for Aspen and the ACG is to explore this notion of um, a transatlantic agenda on the future of work, um, because that's something that that has come up and, and is maybe something that we could we could really focus on. But I, I for my part, would like to, to thank Christina and Juan for um, their inputs today. It's been incredibly valuable. I, I've taken away a lot. I want to remind our viewers that our next state to state event will be on June 23rd, and we'll be focusing on infrastructure and the urban rural divide. I know that there was a question in the chat about broadband infrastructure and the digital divide, and we'll undoubtedly get into that a little bit when we talk about infrastructure issues more broadly. Um, but of course, Stormy, thank you as ever for, for leading the discussion and, and let me give you the last word. And I also want to thank you. And if you want to dig a little bit deeper, get more numbers, for example, also on Florida and North Rhine-Westfalen, um, there is a wonderful publication um, which RGIT is putting um, out, and that is um, uh, German Business Matters, um, with, which offers a lot of data um, on US German investment. And um, that is something which we um, took a look at when we prepared for this event. I want to thank our two speakers. I want to thank also for uh, also Viola for jumping right in. <laughs> and I certainly also want to thank our teams for preparing everything again, because without Wiebke and without Rob and also without Annika, this event wouldn't have been um, possible. We hope to see you soon again on June 23rd um, and maybe even earlier than that in some of our other Aspen um, events and uh, ACG events. Take care, stay healthy, and enjoy the summer. <laughs> <laughs>